Welcome to DSC versus the Others, a song of configuration management. My name is Missy Janusko, and the first thing I'm going to open with is how many people are familiar with the Game of Thrones references in my title? I was very excited about being able to incorporate Game of Thrones into my speech. Um, the only reference that I'm going to make right now is that um, I was actually concerned after last night that I was going to show up looking like an other because of the whole blue face and makeup, and I wasn't sure that I would be able to get all the makeup off in time for my presentation. So I'm glad that I'm not a White Walker. Um, I won't, you know, flash ice at you or anything like that. So um, the one thing that I do want to mention is even though it's called DSC versus the others. Now, in Game of Thrones, you have you know, the good guys, which is basically everyone that's left that hasn't been already killed, versus the White Walkers or the others, um, which are basically the undead. Um, and you have this battle of good versus evil. I just want to make note that DSC is not the good, and the others are not the evil. All of these products are widely different. They do similar things. Um, but my intent here is not to make one out as a bad product and one as a good product or anything like that, just to show you some basics on what you can do with uh, a couple of the other products as well as DSC. Um, and some things that I think are interesting and would really like to see DSC do. So again, my name is Missy Janusko. That's how you pronounce it, so. Um, I am, or have been, one of the poster children for changing your career with PowerShell. A um, Couple years ago, I was an Active Directory person, and that was my job, and I learned this thing called PowerShell, and now I am talking about configuration management and PowerShell and DSC, and I'm standing up here in front of you all, and it's very, very exciting. Um, I recently, uh, last year I was self-employed, and I was going out and doing my own thing, um, but I recently took a new position. This is my third week, so. Um, I'll be a DevOps pipeline engineer at a financial services company. Right now, I am working on some ServiceNow and PowerShell integration, but I'm soon to transition into this new role. I'm the author of the DSC book with Don Jones, so that is my main area of expertise, and I, unfortunately, I don't use it very much right now at work, but I'm still very interested in configuration management products. However, I am not the DSC diva, I'm the DevOps diva on Twitter. So my goal for this presentation was not only to learn something new for myself, but to be able to teach it and explain it to you all um, in the room in a way that makes sense for everyone. So I started learning something new, but at the same time, I was also looking for a new job. And I had this resume building quandary now. Have you ever read job descriptions for people who are looking for somebody with expertise in configuration management? Does, do, have you ever seen one that says, I want somebody who has expertise in DSC? Only recently. recently? Okay, that's good, because I haven't had that experience. In fact, a lot of them read something to the effect of, oh, um, I want somebody who's got expertise in Azure and Google Cloud and AWS, or I need someone with configuration management experience in Chef and Puppet and Ansible. But DSC is very rarely mentioned. Um, so if you see something that says DSC, you know, send it my way. No, I'm just kidding. Um, While I was doing my resume building, I had dabbled in Chef, meaning that I took an internal class, and 
I think I probably spent a lot of time writing DSC code on the side while I was listening to the class. Um, and I was working on uh, the, the Pluralsight course on Puppet, which was really a good course, but I realized that it was slightly outdated. Um, I, think it, I think actually the, the, the course was maybe from 2016 or something like that. So I, I really wanted to learn the latest and greatest configuration management products, and I wasn't really sure where to start. So job postings don't ask for DSC experience, but they do ask for generalized or specialized. They might mention a specific product, but specialized or generalized configuration management knowledge. So my goal here is to show you some of the differences between what DSC does and what some of the other products do as well. One last note. The opinions that I express here are my own. They are not my, the opinions of my company. They are not my, the, the opinion of everyone else. And again, no bad products, just maybe learning experiences. I had a lot of learning experiences while I was going through learning some of these products, and I'm gonna share some of them with you, and you'll get a kick out of some of them, but um, these are my own experiences. Again, no bad products, but I did fail a lot, and it's okay. So let's talk about DSC for a minute and just kind of a review. One of the good things about DSC is that it is a platform and it's not a tool, which means you can roll your own tool set. A lot of the things that are not built in, you can make your own. Kind of like some, you know, I know Gail has some uh, tooling that he's built around DSC in the uh, configuration data arena. You have the ability to build your own tool sets. This is one of the best benefits for me, is that I, if you have PowerShell knowledge and experience, you don't have to learn a new language in order to use DSC. Your, your PowerShell knowledge will transfer over to your DSC knowledge. It's declarative, which you'll see in many of the other configuration management products, they are also declarative, which means you can say, I want my server to look like this, and it will apply itself that way. All right, I listed this as a benefit. Eh, benefit, detriment, depends on how you look at it. Love them or hate them, it does have the ability to do composite configurations and break your configurations apart and make this group responsible for this portion of the configuration and this group responsible for that portion of the configuration. Depends on your, how, how your organization works. Um, partial configurations, again, Because they are compiled when you are putting it on the server, um, they're not really recommended. But it's still a benefit in that it gives you options on how you can um, deploy your configurations. And this is one that I was really interested in, is that you can use DSC, and you can use the vast number of DSC resources that are already out there in other configuration management tools, and this is one of the things I'm gonna show you later. All right, drawbacks of DSC. Oh wait, it's a platform and not a tool. If you don't want to roll your own tool sets, DSC is primitive compared to some of the other products. I 
should probably stop walking around. Where tooling exists, some of the tooling, and I'm looking at you, poll server, lacks some key functionality. Um, many of these other products have highly available poll servers, chef servers, puppet masters, whatever you want to call them. Um, whereas DSC at this moment in 5.1 doesn't really have that high availability in their poll server as we would like them to. Um, no SQL server, no web server scalability. Hopefully that's going to change with the next version. I thought this was an interesting one because we always have the configuration data debate. This is Gail's favorite topic. Um, if you're authoring a DSC configuration, you're basically taking your configuration data and you are laying it out in a file and you're munging the two files together, the configuration and the configuration data to make your MOF file. There are automated ways in some of these other products of gathering that information so you don't have to type it into a file. We'll see some of that in the demo as well. All right, when I first started uh, preparing this, I was going to look at all of these products. I was so excited. And as I started getting into them, I realized exactly what I was taking on by trying to look at all of the products and compare them all. So I had to narrow down my scale a little bit, and I chose to look at Chef and Puppet. Um, if I had had more time, Ansible would have been right in there because I've seen um, a lot of good blog articles on using Ansible for configuration management on Windows servers and things like that. All right. So let's get into some of, I'm gonna, and I'm choosing to do Chef first because I'm actually doing some chef work at my job um, for no other reason <laughs> other than, oh wait, it's alphabetical. That's what it is. <laughs> hmm? Best goes last. All right, to develop in chef, you have a couple of different tools. VS Code, everybody or most folks who are already working in PowerShell have at least a little bit of primitive knowledge of VS Code. It's, a it's an editor. It has a plugin or an extension for Chef. Uh, and then there's the Chef DK, which is the Chef development kit. It is basically a customized PowerShell console you can use to run chef commands as well. The communication between the chef client, so the chef client, I wish I had a pointer, I'll just point. The chef client is an agent that runs on your node. The chef server is basically your pull server. And there is two-way communication between the two. The workstation is where you author your config. I'm gonna call it config for now. Oh, pointer. Thank you. Oh, he's got one too. Thank you. Look at that. Chef client is also the command that you run to deploy a config to your node. So not only is it the agent, but it's also the command. You can have a node 
that is in local mode. So you just pull, you just deploy it to your own machine without the chef server involved. Or you can have the chef server set up. My workstation is actually my laptop. And on it, I'm going to use VS Code to edit my configuration. There's another word for it, but we'll get to that in a minute. Um, Where was I? Oh yeah, VS Code. I'm gonna use VS Code to edit it, and then I'm going to use some chef commands to upload it to the chef server. So chef uses the word recipe to describe their configuration. So I'm gonna keep saying configuration because that's the DSC term for it. And as we go through some of these different products, I'm gonna try to switch the terminology to the one that I'm talking about now. So now I'm gonna talk about recipes. The recipe is the configuration that contains the resources to apply to the server. The recipe, when you write it, it applies it in the order that it is written. Note that this is a little bit different from DSC. DSC has, DSC in theory will apply it in any random order that it chooses. Now, I don't know if anybody has this experience, but I've seen basically where it just goes through and goes in order anyway. Um, I haven't really seen it deviate. The default language for Chef is Ruby. And I'm not sure that I put that in there, but the, the language is Ruby. A cookbook is a structure of directories that contains the recipe and all of the files that go along with that recipe. That can include things like templates that can help you to use configuration data to abstract your node-specific information away from your code. Templates. Knife is the command that you run on your workstation to communicate with the chef server. So there's various things that you can do. You can do things like knife node and edit a node edit node information or list node information. It's a query mechanism and editing mechanism between you and your chef server. Authentication between your nodes and your chef server is done through public private key exchange. Um, and we'll get to that when I show you the demo and how to set up your keys. All right, bootstrapping chef nodes. Bootstrapping is the process where you would go through to connect your node to your chef server. So there's a couple of things that you need to do and remember. Number one, you need the IP address of your node and for my demo, I'm running in Azure. So every time I boot up my chef node, my IP address changes. So I have to go into the chef server each time and, get, and remind it what its IP address is. So that's why I have this up here. Firewall should be configured to allow WinRM traffic in because that's how you communicate with your um, when you, when you run the command that will apply your recipe to the box, um, that traffic happens over WinRM. I'm gonna show you some of this actually. So generating your knife.rb and your pem file. Oh great. You've timed out. All 
All right, so for my demo environment, I am running um, what's called hosted chef. Um, it's basically like a shared instance of chef that you can have a couple of nodes attached to. Um, so I am not running this on Azure or my local machine. It is just, it's a shared instance out there in the cloud somewhere. Um, uh, this is why I sign into everything before. All right, so everybody's gonna pretend that they didn't see my passwords there. <laughs> It's not recorded? I thought it was. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> All right. So I have an organization that's set up in the Chef server called Missy Chef. And I can come into my organization and I can say generate knife config. And what this is gonna do is it's gonna generate a file for me that has all of the information about word wrap. Not word wrap. Come on. All right, you know what? I'm gonna show it to you here instead. Now you're gonna see how bad my typing is. All right, so when I go into the chef server and generate the knife.rb file, this is the information that it stores. And it gives me my node name, which is actually my username in this case because my workstation is not bootstrapped, but it is connecting. Um, the name of my PEM file where my private key is stored. The URL that I'm connecting to and the organization. And then the knife editor, which I'd never change from the default, which is notepad. And that gets stored in my, so my chef, my repository, my chef repo is called Learn Chef. And the only reason I'm using this name is because that is the name of their, when I was going through all the learnings, that was the name of their learning repo. And I figured, well, I already have a repo set up, so why do another one? And then this hidden, hidden folder is .chef, which is where my knife.rb and my pem file is going to go. So, to get my pem file, I would come in here to users. Come on, users. And I'm not gonna do it, but I would do reset key and I would get a new key file. I'm not gonna do it because I'll probably mess everything up if I do. All right. So I talked about the Chef DK a little bit. This is actually the Chef DK window. It looks just like PowerShell. I, it's an administrative console, but it does give me, when I log on, how you know it's the Chef DK, it tells you, hi, oh hi, welcome. All right, so then, Go ahead. It is pretty much a PowerShell console, yes. And you can actually, if you have the, the, um, the path to the, bi the binaries in your, in your path statement, you can actually use the PowerShell console to run knife commands. And that's how I typically do it anyway. Um, but for demo purposes, I decided to use the Chef DK. So if I want to basic, if I want to query
my chef server and find out which nodes I have connected, I can do a knife node list and it will go out to the chef server and ask it which nodes do you have and it should come back with chef node one, which is my registered node. Oh, another thing, since my nodes are in, my node is in Azure, if your nodes are in the cloud, you add the public IP address to the attributes list for that node. Nodes. Select a node. And somewhere in here I have the, uh, it's under normal, somewhere. Anybody see it? Um, this one is actually, that is the private IP address. Um, it's under normal somewhere, but I just can't seem to find it right now. All right, let's do this. If I do a knife node edit, it's going to bring me up an editor and it's going to show me editable attributes. This is how I add the public IP address in there. Oh, I forgot the node name. Knife node edit chef node one. All right, see I have a normal set of attributes and in there is my public IP address. So if you're in Azure and you have public and public facing versus private IP addresses. All right. Knife node edit. All right, so we're gonna switch to the demo and we're gonna do, I'm gonna do a really simple demo of, a, of creating a chef cookbook with a very small recipe and deploy it to my client. So everybody say a prayer to the demo gods <laughs> for me. All right. Seven? Hmm? Seven? You're the Seven. <laughs> nice. All right, Chef DK. So I like VS Code for editing, but I hate the terminal. <laughs> and it, it lies to you sometimes, like uh, I'll do just like a get child item and, it, it, and I expect to see certain things there because I know they're there and I don't see them. So I'm going to use the demo file in VS Code, but I'm going to type, I'm going to transfer it over here. So. All right. I'm going to go into the cookbooks directory. I'm doing get child item just to show you there's no nothing under summit demo which is going to be the name of my cookbook and I'm going to do chef generate cookbook summit demo Somebody have a question over there? No? All right. So now I have a summit demo. And it created the, the directory structure for my cookbook for me. All right. 
Next, I'm going to bring up my simple. configuration. And this is the simplest configuration that I could come up with. Um, it's going to do three things. It's going to use a PowerShell script to install IIS, which is add Windows feature. It's going to start the World Wide Web Publishing Service. And it's going to add a directory and give my ID rights to read that directory. Now, this is one of the things that I think is really neat about some of these other products is how easy it is to assign rights to a folder. How many people have tried doing this in DSC? Is there a, actually a, um, a module for it yet? <laughs> He's saying, eh, not so much. There's, a, there's an NTFS module. I've tried to write my own using GetAckle, and, and it makes me cry. So I think I, I, this is one of the things that I think is really easy in the other products so that is really difficult in DSC. So I think that's neat. Um, all right. Very simple config. What do you think of the syntax for this? Do you think it's easy to read? Do you think it's easier or harder than DSC? About the same? Yeah. I don't think it's terribly difficult. If I had to write it on my own, I'd probably have to Google the syntax until I got used to it. But um, So I'm going to save this as in my recipes folder. could have put it in a less messy place, but. Oh, look, I already have it there. Uh, uh, well. All right. So now I've written my recipe. I have it saved in my recipes folder. Now I'm going to upload it to the chef server. DK. So it's going to take that whole cookbook, send it up to the chef server so that I can use it on my node. All right, so it uploaded. Um, one last thing before I show you the apply. Um, this particular node is set up with a role. So rather than like in DSC, how you can do node name and deploy it to a specific node name, in this example, I have it set up with a role of web server. Um, so I'm going to come in here and I'm going to edit the run list, which is the list of recipes that I'm going to run. And I'm going to, actually, I'm not going to edit this one. This one was an example. Um, but this is what you would do if you were going to change your run list for your node. Um, I actually have to do it like this. Knife roll from file. It'll bring up my editor, and I'll add the uh, Summit Demo cookbook into my run list. Come on. No, I didn't want you to update it. Right. Oh, you know what? I was supposed to edit this one.
Instead of summit, I'm going to do summit dash demo. And it's going to run the default recipe. And I saved that. And now I'm going to knife roll some file. This may or may not work because I just did it from code instead of, yes. Terminate. There we go. All right, once this is done, everybody's going to close their eyes again so they don't see my password. <laughs> All right. Don't look. Um, because it's actually over in Azure. It's not on my machine. There's like a hundred different ways that I could have done this, and what did I do? I chose to save it all in, in KeyPass, so. <laughs> then I'm gonna grab the command so that I can upload it. All right, let's talk about this command for a minute. I'm gonna use WinRM, knife WinRM, the name of the node. Chef client is the command. I'm gonna run chef client. Um, I'm using my WinRM user ID and password, which is my credentials on the machine. And it will connect to, this is where that attribute came in to play. It's gonna to connect to that public IP address to make that WinRM call. Yes. This is actually for the WinRM portion of it. Um, so I'm making a remoting call to the machine to run Chef Client. Does that make sense? Instead of, instead of going over to the machine, logging onto it and saying Chef Client, I'm making, I'm, I'm remoting to it and making, and doing that. Yes, I do have it set on a cycle right now. I think it's 30 minutes, but, yep. That's a good question. I don't really know. Yeah, I don't really see any reason why you couldn't just remote over as long as your path is set up correctly and you have that binary, the binaries in there. I don't see why you couldn't do that as well. All right. So a couple of things in here. I didn't see any red, which is good. Um, it installed IIS. It, it started the, the World Wide Web Publishing Service, and it created my directory for me. All right, so in this... So we created a cookbook, we wrote or edited a recipe. We haven't gotten to templates and files yet. Because I just generated the cookbook, I did not do update the metadata with the version number because it was my first version. It's basically version 0 0.1. I did a knife cookbook upload to send it to the chef server and a chef client run to run it. All right. So here's some of the things that I found I liked about Chef. And the number one thing was hosted Chef server. Um, there, it was very easy to set up. 
I didn't have to think about how to build a chef server or getting the nodes to communicate with it. It just, it was a couple of, of steps and done. Um, the other thing that I like about Chef is I'm using it at work as well, so um, I found it a little bit easier to learn, especially because I was also doing it at work. The documentation is actually pretty good. I think it's pretty good. Um, my coworkers who are also using it at work have different, differing opinions on whether or not it's good for specifically um, people who are trying to manage windows with it. Um, they find it has a little bit of a, um, a Linux slant to it, which is okay. Um, aggravating, uh, there's got to be a way to abstract my IP address away from the configuration so I don't have to edit it every time, but I haven't figured that out yet. All right, so let's switch to Puppet. I know the Puppet guys are super excited about this part. Um, there are two different flavors of Puppet that I found, and um, there's open source Puppet and there's Puppet Enterprise. And I went back and forth between the two. Um, I ended up with a Puppet Enterprise um, machine in Azure, because they actually have an Azure template for it, and it made it almost as easy to bring it up as, as an instance of hosted chef server. Um, for, develop, for the development environment, I have not, there, there's the PE client tools and there's the Puppet development kit and I have not played with either of these, I'm gonna be honest. Um, I stuck to Visual Studio Code and the extension for it um, when I was developing and I would just basically copy and paste my code into the Puppet Master. Puppet has its own language. It's a domain-specific language. Um, so you will see that the syntax is a little bit different um, than Chef. And I stole this graph from, or this uh, graphic from the Puppet website because I thought it really explained a lot about how Puppet works and its terminology and things like that. So a manifest is the equivalent of a chef recipe or a DSC configuration document. It's the document that describes what your configuration will look like. Factor is a really neat, I'm gonna call it a tool, um, that collects information about your node and makes that information available to your configuration so that you, so that you can use. It's kind of like an automated config data kind of thing. The catalog is the compiled version of what your system's going to look like. So similar to DSC, you write your configuration you compile them, it together with the configuration data and you make a MOF file. The catalog is the Puppet equivalent of the MOF file. And in this graphic, the node will re... When a node requests a configuration, it sends information to the Puppet Master about itself and it gathers facts the Puppet Master takes those facts and compiles it into a catalog with your manifest. Sorry, I gotta switch. A class is a named grouping of resources. Now, I named my class Summit Demo. Same as, you know, same as I did in, in the chef side. However, you could have a grouping of resources, say, for SQL Server or web servers or something like that and have that be contained in a class. The main class is always in a manifest called init.pp, which is what we're going to see in a minute. And then the module is really the directory structure and the hierarchy around the manifest. It's the equivalent of a chef cookbook.
And Puppet is also, along with Chef, um, I threw this in here because I think it's more evident in the Puppet side than in, in the Chef side, but it is portable for both Windows and Linux. And I find it really neat how you can just say, say in a configuration, if your operating system is Windows, do this. If your operating system is Linux, do this instead. Um, and I think DSC is actually going there when they get to six. Um, they, they've introduced some new variables as well. So DSC is catching up on this. All right, bootstrapping. We're gonna talk about this. Bootstrapping the puppet nodes. Okay, so I have a little story and this is my experiences with the Puppet Master. Um, I built my first Puppet Master in Hyper-V. It was not in Azure. And I got the Puppet Master up and running. And I would say the biggest pain that point that I had was my own lack of knowledge in Linux. It actually had nothing to do with Puppet. It was a, I knew what I wanted to do in Linux. I didn't know how to do it. So, you know, Google was my friend. Google this, Google that. So I got the Puppet, and I'll, I'll be honest, the Puppet Master was very, very easy to install. One, I think it was one command and up and running. Um, configuring firewalls and DNS and all the connectivity stuff, that was another story. So then I got my Puppet node started up and I went to bootstrap it. And I ran the MSI file and I installed the agent. And then there's this exchange of keys. And so you run a puppet apply for the first time and it says, I don't know who you are. I'm gonna send a certificate request to the puppet master and somebody's gotta come over and sign it and then send the signed certificate back. And so I ran Puppet Apply and it said, I don't know what you're talking about, so go over to the Puppet Master. I went over to the Puppet Master and I would list the certificates that were available to be signed and nothing's there. I'm like, what the heck? Back and forth, back and forth. Or it would say it doesn't match, the certificate doesn't match, doesn't match what I have. Here are the instructions to delete what you've got and start over. So I'd follow the instructions and I could not get the things to talk to each other. Long story short, after calling friends and friends of friends and people who knew more than I did, they said, you're not root. And I'm like, but I, I typed sudo and it said sudo, you know, sudo puppet doesn't exist. So I just typed puppet and it, but it didn't do anything. They're like, you're not root. Two things I learned out of this. Number one, my very first attempt on Hyper-V was Ubuntu. And Ubuntu does not have root enabled by default. Number two, there's a special way that you do sudo in Azure and you don't just type sudo because otherwise you're not really root. Once I got through all of my Linuxy problems, I did a puppet apply dash T, sent the certificate over to the puppet master, puppet master signed it, sent it back, everything was good. So that's my long story about Puppet Master. All right, so we have a, sim we have a very similar um, set of steps to do Puppet. Make the module structure. On the Puppet side, um, and I might actually just switch to my demo. Here I actually kept my structure around as I was testing because I didn't want to have to recreate it and have you watch me type a lot. Um, 
So I am starting out. I am on my Puppet Master. I am logged in as root. Uh, and the first thing it is that I go to Etsy Puppet Labs code. And then from there, environments. Did I spell that wrong? CD, no, oh, yes. All right. So this is the directory structure and inside my modules directory, a module is the structure that the, the, the directory structure that has all of the manifests in it. So I'm gonna go to the modules directory. Modules. And here I've got a couple of different modules. I've got the summit demo, which is the one I'm going to apply, but I also have a couple of modules that I need for my manifest um, that I downloaded from the Puppet Forge. So, um, CD summit demo. All right, so let's take a look at init.pp. And this recipe does exactly the same thing that my chef demo did. However, I'm doing it in a little bit different way. So rather than running a PowerShell script, and I'll be completely transparent, I'm not doing the PowerShell script because I couldn't get it to work, and I didn't want to fight with it. <laughs> so I switched to, I'm going to use the DSC Windows feature to install IIS. I'm using a service resource to start up the service. And here I'm doing the directory, but I left out the ACL for now. Um, I, in order to use the DSC Windows feature resource, I needed to go out to the Puppet Forge and grab the DSC module. Stuff got out of order. Sorry about that. All right. Um, I'm going to grab this command here. This is one of the things that I liked about Puppet is that I can check my syntax with Puppet parser validate init.pp. Now, especially since I'm just getting st started with Puppet, um, I made a lot of syntax errors, a lot of mistakes. Um, I personally have a problem with quotes and closing thing, closing brackets and things like that. So um, this validate is awesome for me. All right. Next, we're going to update site.pp. So I'm going to go switch back. to the manifest directory. And I'm going to edit site.pp. Now what this file does is this is how you link the node to the class that we're going to run. So I'm going to say for node puppet client, I'm going to include the summit demo class. Save that. And then I can go to my puppet client.
run up PowerShell. And I also have a Puppet client on here as well. But I can do it through PowerShell as well. Puppet apply dash T. Now there's also a dash dash no op option, which allows you to do the equivalent of a PowerShell what if. It will tell you what's going to be applied, but it won't actually apply it for you. Always a good um, test. I probably should have taken that off because now I'm going to have to run it twice. But While this is running, are there any questions? I think that if I were looking for an enterprise class product, something that I was going to use across all of my production environments, I would go with something that is commercially viable, that it has the high availability that you want for your production environment. Um, knowing what I know about the pull server, I mean, I, I just, I have this thing about the pull server, like it's not, it just doesn't feel as complete as these other products. How's that? Um, there is a learning curve. And the, you know, the syntax is a little bit different. How you get things to work is a little bit different. Um, like I said, I, I was discouraged with some of the stuff about getting my PowerShell script to run, so I just switched it. It does seem like there's many different ways to do what you want to do. I don't, I don't know enough about either of the products to say this is a best practice, um, but that's what, if you want to talk about best practices, I'm sure you can sit down with any of the guys here and talk to them about it. Yep. So Steve Morosky. Mm -hmm. But both of these products, you can use DSC. You can use DSC modules that you get from the gallery in your configurations. How you get it there is just a little bit different. I might let me check my time. I might switch to that demo just so you can see it. Um, that was my that was going to be my final demo. I don't know what's going on with this. It's just a little cranky sometimes. Hmm. I think it depends because you also because both Chef and Puppet also have their own repositories of modules. So if you look at um, and I think I looked today. Puppet had over 5,000 modules in their Puppet Forge. Um, Chef had over 3,000 modules. I am sure that the gallery, the PowerShell gallery, does not have that kind of um, numbers. I don't, well, I don't think. I shouldn't say I'm sure. Um, but there's a wide range of options for you. So if you are more comfortable with Chef, if you're more comfortable with Puppet, and you would rather use their modules, by all means, I'm using the DSC module. And by the way, I love it. Okay, that's one of the things that I really liked about this is that um, when you install the Puppet DSC module, it pulls all the stuff in, the, in from the gallery for you. I didn't have to do a darn thing to get a DSC module into Puppet. Whereas my chef recipe, I had to do some 
finagling. So I'm going to actually switch back to my demo and I'm going to show you some of that because it's fun. All right. So this is my this is this was intended to be my final demo, um, and it's the same equivalent of both Chef and Puppet. I'm doing installing IIS. I got the Windows, the World Wide Web Publishing Service. I got the www root. I'm applying some permissions. Now for in on the Puppet side, when I'm applying the permissions, I'm using another module from the Forge called the ACL um, module, and it does the permissions for me, which is awesome. All right, and then I'm doing something that I don't feel that you can do well in DSC. Um, I'm doing two file resources here. One of them is going to grab an image from my cookbook or from my module. See, now I have to stop myself and make sure that I'm using the right terminology for the right, um, for the right product. So this is the, this is the puppet version of my, my final config. I'm taking a file and I'm putting it inside my module and I'm delivering it to the server. I'm not setting up a share or anything that it has to go reach out to somewhere else and get it. It's all encompassed within the module. The other thing is templates. And both Chef and Puppet do templates, but this is the way of abstracting out the information of what I'm putting in my web server page from the actual code that's putting it in there. And actually, let me go grab that so you can see it. So this is what my web page would look like. I would have an image at the top, and then it's going to say hello from and whatever my node's name is. Simple, easy, but I don't know of a good way that, how would you do this in DSC? I feel like you would have to, ha yeah, you would have to have the image in a, in a file share somewhere. And then as far as this page goes, you'd probably have to have it in your configuration data. All right. And then the last thing that I'm doing in this part, in this manifest is I'm using the X time zone resource to set this time zone. I don't know why it's in there twice. I wanted to make sure it was set, I guess. Probably a copy and paste error. But I didn't have to do anything other than install the DSC module to use X time zone. And I just, when I found that out, I thought this was really, really awesome. Did a nice job. All right, let's see if I can. This is the chef equivalent. No, it's not default final. There we go. So I have the initial same three resources to install the web server, services, directory. And notice Chef does the same thing with the cookbook file. In this case, it's, it's, in, a, um, it's in a directory inside the cookbook called files. Same thing for templates. Um, this template is stored in a templates directory and it's all uploaded as part of the cookbook. So it's all right there in your chef server. 
However, I had to do something a little different in order to get X time zone to my server in Chef. So I am also packaging up the cookbook file and I'm creating it inside my Chef server. And then when it gets to the node, then I'm, un then I'm using the Windows zip file to unzip it. So I'm basically placing that resource there so that it can be used. The other thing that I did try to do, and I just, I was unsuccessful, um, was run a PowerShell script to do find module, install module. However, I didn't have any luck with it. So I changed it to this. And then again, I'm using DSC resource time zone. Same thing. All right, so let's get all of the items that we need for the chef apply. Come on. I'm going to make the, the files and the templates directories. I'm going to copy my, my image file and my template file into those new directories. Thank you. Should have everything set up at this point. I have a files directory. Let's check. I have my image file there. Templates. And I have my template file there. All right. One last thing I'm going to do here is I'm going to increase the version number. I'm going to call it 0 0.2.0. 0. I'm going to upload the new cookbook. Why did I do that? This is the problem with having too many terminals up at once. All right, let's upload it there. Knife when I am. I'll grab this command while we're waiting. All right, so now I got 0.2.0 .0 uploaded. Send that config over. All right, while that is applying, I'm going to go back to my Puppet Master so I can do the same thing. I'm going to go to my modules directory.
This is where my Linux, my lack of Linux knowledge is showing. Help me out with rename. How do I rename a file? I'm looking at you. MV. Yes, this is, I have been a Windows person for as long as I can remember. And um, my, my Linux skills are rudimentary <laughs> at best. So let's take a quick look at init.pp. We got DSC Windows feature, ACL, the graphic, the template, the time zone. It's only in there once. Sweet. All right. Site.pp is already set up, so I shouldn't have to do anything more other than apply it. So I'm going to quick go back to Chef. Looks like my Chef run is complete. Do the same thing with the Puppet apply. Puppet client. All right, I'm gonna do this a little bit different way now that I'm thinking about it. I'm gonna use the run puppet agent instead of doing it from the command line or from a PowerShell script. Yay, it's talking. So now it's applying my manifest, and yay, it's done. No, it's not done. It's almost done. <laughs> there we go, applied catalog. OK, so at this point, on, a, on Chef Node 1, I should have a website, and on Puppet Client 1, I should have a website. Dun, dun, dun. We're going to find out. Don't look. <laughs> okay, that's not the website I expected. Huh? It's certainly a site, yes. Okay, that's not what I expected, but sure. That probably means that I uploaded the wrong recipe, but that's okay. Um, I'm looking for the name of my puppet client because I can never remember what it is. To look. Yes, I'm shutting down all of these nodes as soon as this is over. So. <laughs> Ta-da! Anybody in Daybreak Faction? Cool. The Chef one would have been Flawless Faction, but I'm not going to try to troubleshoot it right now. So we did the custom DSC resource examples. I'm going to go back to the slideshow for a couple more slides. Oh, current. Not that current slide. Here's where you can go to learn more about both of these products. Now, I, this is where I started for both of them. Um, Learn.chef.io has self-directed education that you can go to to go through and you know do some examples and bring up an instance on Hosted Chef and connect something up to it. Um, Learn.puppet.com, which I don't know why, um, but that's not where I started for Puppet. I started with the Puppet docs. Um, I have to say that I said Chef's documentation was 
pretty good. Um, Puppet's documentation is really, really good, but he's, he's, he's like breathing a sigh of relief. But some of it is way over my head. Um, some of it is very, very detailed information. Um, so uh, while the documentation is good, it's not a good place to get started at. This learn.puppet.com and their learning VM um, is awesome. And you can download it and it's an appliance. You put it in virtual box if you want to play with it. I have a laptop that's actually running it. Um, but that is how I got started with both of these. Forge.puppet.com is where you would go to um, grab Puppet modules. Chef's equivalent is called Chef Supermarket. I'm not entirely certain why I don't have the link to that as well. Um, and then I found this article recently um, from Petri about how to configure a Puppet Master. And I just kind of came across that when I was troubleshooting my Puppet Master, Puppet Agent um, problems. And it said, here's how you bring up a Puppet Master in Azure. There's an extension. Go click it. Bring it up. Um, you bring up an, a second node or a second Azure instance as your agent. It has, a, it has an Azure extension. It's already there once the server comes up. All you need to do is do that certificate exchange procedure and you are good to go. Questions? <laughs>